we go. So July 23rd, 2018, I was in a six-seat white van traveling along the dirt road in Hunan, China, with my entire family and our tour guide. I was on my way to visit my orphanage for the first time since being adopted in 2002 at the age of 18 months. Once we were arrived at the Ping Zhang Children's Welfare Institute, we were welcomed by nannies holding flowers. They spoke just as much English as I did Chinese, which wasn't very much, so our tour guide helped us translate. The staff there gave us a tour of the orphanage, showing us where the kids slept, ate, and played. Afterwards, they brought me to a special room where they had prepared a package with all the documents and photos of me from the time from my time at the orphanage. They even gave me a baby photo that my parents nor I had ever seen before. Being adopted has meant that there are just holes in my life history that I may never know. Many other families have baby photos and stories from when they are young, but mine does not. My parents knew the stories that the nannies told them but by the time I came to the U.S., I was already walking and talking, so I wasn't much of a baby anymore. But now, I have my first and only baby photo. After going over the files they gave me, I ended up chatting with the nannies. One of the nannies told me, or none of the nannies that looked after me still worked at the orphanage, but two kids remained from the time I was there. I had the fortune to meet one of the kids, a boy named Neil Yang, and learn more about him. He was born with both physical and mental disabilities, which is likely the reason why he was given up for adoption, as well as why he had not been adopted. At the time of my birth, Hunan, or more specifically, Pingjiang County, the region I am from, was a very poor farming village. Also, the family planning policy, or more colloquially referred to as the one child policy, was in full effect. This meant that families only had one child they could rely on for financial support, and if they happened to have a child who couldn't contribute, then putting them up for adoption was almost necessary. There are loopholes to the one-child policy, such as being able to have a second child if the firstborn is born with a mental or physical disability uh, that prevents them from working. However, the financial strain of having another mouth to feed was usually too overwhelming for a lot of these small families. In 2015, three years before my orphanage visit, the policy changed to allow families to have two children without paying a fine. This policy change had unintended consequences for orphanages. The orphanage workers explained that the new policy was turning orphanages into homes for kids with mental and or physical disabilities, many of which go unadopted. In the past, when children age out of an orphanage, they were released to live on their own. But unfortunately, many of these children will not be able to live independently. I don't know what happened to the boy I met, but I'd like to think that he was doing well, possibly living at the orphanage with all the nannies. However, the reality of money and resources tells me otherwise. Getting to meet Liu Yang and learning how the two-child policy changed the face of orphanages redefines what it means to be grateful for me. I always carry everything I learned that day with me and reflect on all the opportunities now afforded to me because I was adopted. Wanting to learn everything I could about my adoption, China's child limiting policies, and my Chinese heritage, I pursued an Asian Studies minor here at Creighton, where I had the fortune to meet Dr. Ma Rang Jiang, who encouraged me to dive deeper into the one child policy and guided this research project. So what I have learned is that China's one-child policy had unintended repercussions that mutated international adoption, altering the face of Chinese society, and enabling rampant corruption, all of which is virtually unknown by the public. China has fostered long-held secrets that I will reveal and contextualize through my lived experiences as a Chinese adoptee. In 1979, the one-child policy was added to the Chinese constitution to limit population growth and manage limited resources. The Department of Family Planning was created to enforce this law at the state, city, and village levels. It gave authority to family planning officials with little to no oversight, which led to unimaginable abuses of power. 
These officials monitored all pregnant women, women that have already had children, and all birth certificate paperwork for their area. In Hunan, after having her first child, a mother would be forcefully sterilized before the child would receive what is called a hokua, a legal document similar to a birth certificate in the United States. In later years of the policy, women were forced to get IUD implants instead of hysterectomies and were subjected to mandatory check-ins every few months to ensure that the IUDs were still in place. According to Chinese legal experts and state-run news agency Xinhua, these arbitrary restrictions have no legal basis and violate Chinese laws. These methods varied slightly depending on region, but it represents the barbaric and inhumane ways the one child policy was enforced. Further, family planning officials were known to search villages for undocumented children, creating constant fear, even for those abiding by the rules. If a woman was found pregnant with a second child and had already received permission, they would forcefully abort the fetus. As midwife Bar Yuan explains, I really don't know how many babies I delivered. What I do know is that I've done a total of between 50,000 to 60,000 sterilizations and abortions. But I had no choice. It was the government's policy. The horrific violations of bodily autonomy and right to medical consent these women and their families endured have left lasting scars that can never be fixed. Now, if family planning officials happen to find any unregistered children, they would impose an exorbitant birth fine. Carolyn Khan, a woman born as a legal second child, states that her family paid 910 US dollars to the government for permission to have a second child. She explains, in 1989, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, the average income in urban areas was $192, while in rural areas it was just 91. In short, the penalty Khan's family paid was nearly 10 years worth of income. And despite paying the fine, they still lived in fear of the family planning officials. The excessive birth fines, however, were not exclusive to rural regions, nor the early years of the policy. In 2012, it is recorded that a family paid $1.2 million to have a third child. And it is estimated that these excessive birth fines have helped China accrue 2 trillion yuan, or 315 billion US dollars, from the one-child policy since its creation. While it may seem as if China was unaware of the actions of the family planning officials, in reality, China was turning a blind eye to the pervasive corruption occurring because of the immense profits it granted. Surprisingly, paying the fine was often the best case scenario. If families could not pay the fine, family planning officials would often steal or damage the family's property and even kidnap the child, all of which violated Chinese law. However, these illegal actions became the protocol that made family planning officials notorious. In addition, traditional Chinese family values played a big role in how the one-child policy played out. In Chinese culture, it is traditional to have a large family. Often, boys are favored over girls. This is because males carry the bloodline when they marry, which means that when women marry, they join the, their husband's family and assume the role of caretaker for his elders. China does not offer retirement or health care plans, so families rely on their sons to marry and provide for them in old age. Limiting families to only one child, mixed with the social realities of Chinese tradition, led to prizing boys with giving up girls for adoption. To an extent, this narrative was true. Families were genuinely giving up their daughters for adoption in the hopes of having a son. However, China manipulated this narrative and exaggerated the extent to which girls were being put up for adoption, making adopting a girl from China seem like a noble act and allowing international adoption to flourish. Despite in reality, the one-child policy was creating a black market for children, where selling boys domestically and girls internationally was extremely lucrative. The practices of family planning in rural villages created a win-win situation for these officers that proved to be exceptionally profitable. The excessive birth fines, if payable, helped family planning officials profit 
and increase the number of illegal children in these poor communities. <laughs> Within the first decade of the policy, it was estimated that only 5% of all registered working women or urban women had a second child without permission, while 60% of all registered peasant women had a second child without permission, which created the perfect pool of children for these officers to profit from. Further, since the family planning departments in rural regions had minimal government oversight, hiding their criminal behavior was easy and allowed for their perfect system to be so profitable. I learned about this blatant corruption in my sophomore year of college. It led me to reflect on my adoption and forced me to speculate that my adoption story might not be quite what it seems. The narrative my mom gave me was that I was loved, but my family was just too poor to keep me. But I know now that Hunan's family planning branch worked at 100% capacity, and at the time of my adoption, Hunan was mostly a rural farming village. So, it made it the prime location for trafficking to occur. Upon learning this, I called my mom and told her about what my research had uncovered. Together, we started digging through all the paperwork we were given and tried to search for answers. In this search, we stumbled across a researcher named Brian Stye, who had adopted three daughters from China himself. In 2001, he started an organization that worked to research orphanages in China, allowing families of Chinese adoptees to learn more about their orphanage. Through his research, he came upon inconsistencies that led him to question the legitimacy of some of the orphanages. When a child is given up for adoption, orphanages will post finding ads in the local newspaper. They will list details such as the finding location, weight, age, name, and other defining details for the child in the hopes of reconnecting the family with the child. What Brian discovered was that the details published in these finding papers were cited far too frequently to be true. He compared the finding papers for an orphanage over many years and found that the orphanages that were involved in child trafficking were recycling the same information on their finding papers. They did this as a way to seem legitimate despite many of the children being kidnapped, causing unsuspecting loving families to perpetuate the corruption caused by the one-child policy. My mother and I reached out to Brian Sai regarding my specific orphanage to see my finding papers and learn if my orphanage was run legitimately. We were able to find my specific finding papers and it states that I was found in front of the school of Wangjia village at the age of four months. According to Sai's research, my finding location was cited far too often to be true, leading to the belief that the Pingjiang Children's Welfare Institute either knowingly or unknowingly participated in child trafficking. There are no words to quite describe what this meant to me. I knew the one-child policy played some kind of role in my adoption. However, I couldn't fathom how directly it was going to impact me. While this surely wasn't what I expected to learn from my extracurricular research, it did reaffirm one long-held truth that I knew. That my biological family had unimaginable love for me, and so much so that they were willing to risk everything to keep me. In the most twisted way, China's one-child policy and corruption played in my favor. I was born with hereditary spherocytosis, which means that I have an enlarged spleen, or had an enlarged spleen, yeah, which required surgery. If I was living with my biological family or in the orphanage, the necessary medical attention I would need, I just would not have been able to get, and I would have likely passed away around the age of 10. Also, I wouldn't be here today sharing my story and bringing attention to the injustices that have been and are happening in China today. Thank you.